This lecture talks about how racism intersects with the everyday and how race is lived through everyday encounters in modern societies. This is the overview for the lecture. We'll be looking firstly at a few facts and figures behind racism in Australia to try to build up a picture of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about racism and the everyday. Then I'm going to step back and talk a little bit about the theory around racism. What is it? What isn't it? And leading on from that, I'll be thinking about whether or not it's better to think about racism as something that's to do with people's attitudes. Is it part of your psychology? Is it, is it an individual problem? Or should we think about racism more as a systemic or a structural, or as some people would put it, an institutionalized issue? Then I'm going to be thinking about something uh, that connects racism to experience, that really, when we talk about what racism is, we learn from what people who are at the coalface of racism, people who face racism in their everyday lives, tell us about what their lived experience of racism is. Then I'll think about some work that's been done by the uh, Dutch scholar Philomena Essed on everyday racism and how we recognize it. And finally, I'll be looking at a couple of recent uh, examples of everyday racism and then connecting that to the way in which racism plays out both in popular culture and in social media. So let's start off with a few facts and figures focusing here on racism in Australia. During my lecture on multiculturalism, I mentioned that Australia is an extremely diverse country. In fact, 26% of Australians were born overseas and 20% of Australians have a parent who was not born here. According to the Challenging Racism Project carried out by colleagues here at Western Sydney University, uh, who have studied 12,500 people, a number of interesting facts can be drawn out about people's attitudes towards race in the country. Summarizing their findings, the authors of the study found that Australians are generally tolerant people who are accepting and welcoming of other cultures. The survey data indicate that a large majority of Australians are positive about living in a multicultural country and most Australians feel secure and comfortable with cultural difference. The data also indicate that most Australians recognise that racism is a problem in society, and that too many Australians, that is 41% of them, have a narrow view of who belongs in Australia. Out of this, about 1 in 10 people surveyed have very problematic views on diversity and on ethnic difference. They believe that some races are naturally inferior or some superior and that groups should be kept separated. So there's an interesting slippage here between people's general acceptance of multiculturalism as being a good thing in the abstract and their actual beliefs that racism continues to be a problem in society. So I suppose the question is, do people always tell the truth when they are surveyed in such uh, research? because people generally know that being openly racist is a bad thing. So it's interesting to think about what might be concealed in responses when we do these kinds of large-scale um, you know, research projects involving many people answering questions on a questionnaire. However, this does give us a snapshot of where Australians stand in terms of the questions of race and racism. Now we get a much... Uh, closer picture when we look at racism in specific cases and here I want to focus uh, specifically on Aboriginal disadvantage and the disproportionate arrest and incarceration of Aboriginal people in Australia which really kind of tries to go be beyond attitudes to racism um, and helps us to think about what do we actually mean when we talk about the disadvantage and the inequality and the injustice that really summarizes what racism is about. So firstly, just looking at a couple of general facts and figures, some of which you might be aware of, to do with Aboriginal disadvantage. For example, when we take life expectancy, life expectancy for Aboriginal Australians is 16 to 17 years lower than for Australians on the average. In terms of health, 
30% of Aboriginal adults have type 2 diabetes, for example, and Aboriginal children are 30 times more likely than the average population to suffer malnutrition. This is malnutrition in a first world country. 83% of Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory, for example, have decaying, missing or filled teeth. And then when it comes to employment, 13% of Aboriginal people are unemployed, as opposed to around, it's hovering at around 6% of the general population. But the real rate of unemployment is much higher, as in many remote and rural communities, there is no work to speak of. There is also much higher proportions of drug use, according to the figures. Looking now at crime, which is a controversial area when it comes to Aboriginal people, very often Aboriginal people, just like racialized people in other countries, have been thought of as being um, more likely to be involved in crime than other members of the population, uh, although there is not direct evidence for this. Looking, for example, at homicide and victimization, the indigenous homicide rate rests at around 20 per 100,000 people, with victimization, that means being a victim of homicide, uh, at around 14 per 100,000. Non-Indigenous homicide, in contrast, has never exceeded two out of every 100,000. So there's a large discrepancy there in terms of your tendency to be a victim of crime. Indigenous women are twice as likely as non-Indigenous women to commit a homicide, 20% of all homicides compared with 10%. And Indigenous women are more likely to be homicide victims than non-Indigenous women. That is 41% of all victims compared with 32% in the general population. Aboriginal people in general are more likely to report being the victim of violent crime as opposed to crime in general. So there's a high rate of both crime and being a victim of crime among Aboriginal people, particularly in remote areas. Police figures also show that Aboriginal people are also overrepresented in crimes to do with public order, including using offensive language, resisting or obstructing arrest. So this may already point to the potential problems with the ways in which racialized communities are policed. So rather than taking the figures at face value, we really need to look behind the numbers and think about what gives rise to the overcriminalization and over victimization of Aboriginal people in Australia. And we need to think about this as on the par with the United States. We talk very frequently of the mass incarceration of black and Latino uh, people in the United States. There are uh, over two million people in jail in the United States and the overwhelming majority of them are black or, or Latino. But we're in an absolutely comparable situation in certain areas of uh, Australia. So the overall prison population in Australia is 26% Aboriginal people, but when we look at the Western Australia, for example, that rises to 83%. Now, when we compare this to their number among the population, 2 to 3% of the Australian population is Aboriginal, we can see the enormous discrepancy. There's an enormous overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in jail. And the recent um, revelations of what happened at the Dondale Youth Detention Centre and the widespread abuse and what could only be called torture of young Aboriginal children in youth detention is evidence of um, the, extre the extremity of this situation. According to Jeffries and Newbold, Aboriginal people are more likely to come into contact with the police than other groups are. Police are also more likely to intervene it's in certain situations or perceive particular situations to be criminal than they would be for, with the rest of the population. Police also tend to be deployed in greater numbers in areas where there are more Aboriginal people, such as remote and rural communities. This in itself could lead to more criminal behaviour, as police incitement, so for example during protests, can lead to behaviour that then leads to a person's arrest. We can also make connections between low levels of educational attainment or exclusion from school, unemployment, health and crime figures. In other words, we cannot take any of these things as being separated. Generational trauma as a result of, of the long history of Aboriginal dispossession, exclusion and even genocide, including cultural genocide, can also explain the present day levels of discrimination. So not only do majority Australians continue to harbour stereotypes about Aboriginal people, 
but Aboriginal people themselves have also internalised feelings of self-loathing that are often the result of racism. And we'll look at what this means when we look at the lived experience of racism. So it's important to think about racism in a historical context. And I don't want to go into too much detail on the definition that I'm proffering here, but briefly to summarize, when we think about the question, what is racism? What I'm arguing for here is a historicized, that means a setting in context of history of the phenomenon of racism. And briefly, this, uh, this definition that I offer here can be explained as follows. Firstly, racism needs to be seen as a system of domination. It, the result of which is to constrain equality between different groups. In other words, it makes some groups more uh, equal than others. Racism considers human traits to be fixed. In other words, personality is fixed according to the racial group in which you're placed. And that all of this is sustained by the power of the state. In other words, the state uses its institutions, the legal system, the educational system, the health system, uh, the police, the military, and so on, in order to establish what we can think of as regimes of racial rule that continue in more covert or overt situations over time. And that all of this brings about an internalization of racial identity that can have positive impacts in order to solidify solidarity around um, racial affinity between people who belong to racialized groups, but also in order to um, to, to carry through intergenerational trauma born of the history of racism over the years. Now, I'm briefly introducing this definition of racism slightly slyly in order to introduce you to a unit that I run, which is a second year unit called the Racial State, which I would be happy if any of you wanted to join, in which I go into much further detail around this definition and much more. Okay, so returning to our topic, racism and the everyday. Many people believe that we are all a little bit racist. And I think if you were to question yourself right now, you might think, yes, that's generally the case. Most people are in a little bit racist. In a way, it might be true to say that we are all a little bit racist if we're honest with ourselves. But my question is, where does this belief come from? or Where does this attitude come from? Saying that racism is inherent or natural turns it into a psychological state of mind or an attitude that some people have, as opposed to something more structural or systemic uh, in, the, in the sense that I've been talking about it to date. Take this campaign against racism, for example. It's a campaign uh, that was um, used by the Commission for Racial Equality in the UK a couple of decades ago. The picture here plays on the idea that we are frightened of black men, particularly in the dark, it's assumed. But where does this fear come from? Can we assume that being scared of black men is a psychological state, that we are naturally, our brains naturally think uh, in terms of fear when it comes to the appearance of black men in our midst? If we were to do so, we might think that there was some natural inclination to fear people who look a certain way. However, in reality, fear is based, isn't it, on knowledge that we have. We make associations in our minds between the person we see in front of us, a black man in this instance, and stereotypes that come to us from the media, from society, from history, from our families, and we piece all of this together in order to construct an image uh, for ourselves. According to the black British writer Paul Gilroy, in the 1970s and 80s in Britain, there was a lot of moral panic about a crime uh, called mugging or street crime. So a crime involving um, snatching people's handbags in the street, for example. Street crime was associated with young black men, African-Caribbean men, although it's important to note that statistically, these men were no more likely to carry out these crimes than white men or indeed women were. Because of the amounting of uh, the sorry the amount of reporting in the press that linked mugging to young black men, 
people started to identify their attackers as black, even if they actually hadn't seen their faces. So to cite a common example, you might be walking down the street with your handbag, somebody rushes towards you from behind, grabs your handbag and runs off, and all you will have seen in that flash second is the back of that person's head. However, because people were reading so many news reports or watching television reports in which assumptions were being made about the propensity of young black men to be the authors of these crimes, people who were then questioned by the police, even if they had no evidence, were identifying their attackers as young black men. So often when we dismiss racial stereotypes by saying that they are something that only ignorant people you know, have or, or that they're the result of poor education, what we're actually doing is operationalizing a classist argument that assumes that racism is something that only the poor, the ignorant, or the uneducated do. So for example, most middle class people don't like to think of themselves as racist because they see themselves as being more enlightened, as being better educated, and less ignorant. Now, while on an individual level, it might be possible to argue that education does help to overcome racism. I mean, after all, what are we doing here? We cannot base the argument for anti-racist education on the idea that racism is a natural or merely a psychological attitude. Such a view of racism, to my mind at least, is highly apolitical because it fails to examine the structural reasons for why racism exists in society from either historical, sociological, or economic points of view. So in other words, we need to get behind the stereotypes and to look at where the idea of racism actually comes from. So I'm suggesting that it might be more fruitful to look at racism as systemic or institutional, or if you like, structural. These more macro accounts of how racism works roots it historically these accounts then explain individual racist attitudes or acts. So we don't start from the individual attitude or behavior. We think about how the structures, the racialized structures of society, encourage individuals to act in racist ways. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we should excuse people who behave in a racist way, but we may not be able to explain or work towards eliminating racism if we only see it as an individual or a psychological issue. So what is systemic racism? According to Joe Fagan, who's a US-based uh, sociologist, uh, we can think about racism within the US context in a particular way. So the US is comparable in some ways to Australia because they are both settler colonial nations. Although, of course, we need to think about the particularity of the US as being an economy that was established on the back of transatlantic slavery. In other words, the enslavement of African people, which is fundamental for understanding race in America. However, having said that, we also shouldn't think that, that slavery was absent completely from the Australian setting because we know that there's evidence for the enslavement of both Aboriginal people and Pacific Islanders going back to the beginning of settlement in Australia. Having said that, let's have a brief look at what Fagan says about systemic racism. He argues that racial oppression is deeply ingrained in US history and can be found in group relations, institutions, organizations, and power structures. Racial oppression entails grouping people according to hierarchy and giving those who are lower down that hierarchy or down that pecking order less access to power and resources. Systemic racism produces institutions that reproduce this hierarchy. So, for example, creating socioeconomic differences between groups. So, for example, the argument that immigrants take jobs away from citizens, which was very much underpinned by the white Australia policy here, is based on a racialized idea of the labor market, whereby only whites are deserving of good, well-paid jobs. Another example is the government. Why has no government in Australia, post-multiculturalism, been representative of the ethnic diversity in the country? To this day, it is mainly dominated by white men, with very few women and extremely few uh, members of ethnic minorities. So the first uh, 
female Aboriginal MP was elected only uh, last year. The other facet to this is what's called institutional racism. The argument for institutional racism tries to counter the so-called bad apple thesis. In other words, the argument that, for example, we see police racism um, or you know, practices, racist practices by police towards racialized minorities because of a few bad apples who spoil the barrel. So these are racist individuals within institutions rather than institutionally racist uh, police forces or other organizations that then um, make space for uh, racism to occur within those organizations. A focus on systemic or institutionalized racism shows that the bad apples are in fact produced by society and the institution rather than the other way around. So when the police stop and frisk people of color much more frequently than whites, they are carrying out an activity that is in fact condoned by a culture of racism within the institution, even if this is an unspoken one, and even if officially the police uh, is against racism or says that it's against racism. This was recently found following a successful case taken by five African men in Melbourne who accused the Victoria police of racially profiling them. It is also in play in cases of police counter-terrorism operations, which often use racial profiling to make assumptions about who is more likely to carry out terrorist activities. This often leads to Muslim men in particular being targeted more often, leading to their arrest and imprisonment, often without charge. However, this might lead to attention not being paid to far-right extremists who plan and carry out violent attacks. And there are several examples of this in recent history of uh, white terrorists going under the radar because they were not being racially profiled and therefore did not come to the attention of the authorities until it was in fact too late. We might also pay attention to the spate of police shootings of unarmed black people in the US which sparked the Black Lives Matter movement, which has now had, you know, um, this Black Lives Matter UK and also demonstrations in Australia that have taken place around uh, the Black Lives Matter banner. These killings of Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, who was only a 12-year-old boy, or Sandra Bland, to name but a few, can be based on assumptions made about violence or criminality among black people in the U.S., and, of course, Aboriginal people in Australia, which leads to them being over-policed and over-incarcerated, as I mentioned before. One example from Australia is that of Julika Du. Uh, Ms. Du was a 22-year-old Aboriginal woman from Western Australia who was jailed for not paying fines. Uh, in fact, she was a victim of domestic violence who called the police um, to report her attacker and when she reported uh, that attack to police, she herself was arrested and placed in the lockup. While there, she complained of feeling ill, but she was repeatedly ignored. And in fact, at the inquest, it was found that the uh, officers who were guarding her assumed that she had been faking her illness. And a horrible uh, CCTV footage of Ms. Du's being dragged from a bed and, and her head bashed against a hard metal surface um, was found to have happened just moments before she then uh, died in that cell. Ms. Du's case demonstrates that ingrained, racialized assumptions were, in fact, at work. She was considered to be a criminal who, as I said, was faking her illness. Her health didn't seem to be as much of a concern as the need to punish her. Considering the reason for her being in jail in the first place also reveals the extent of institutionalized racism. It is much less likely that a non-Aboriginal person be jailed for not paying fines, whereas in much of Australia, this is the number one reason for the over-incarceration of Aboriginal people, women in particular. And in fact, Aboriginal women are the fastest growing group among the imprisoned population in Australia and in the majority of cases, they're being arrested uh, for not paying fines. So I want to try to relate this 
a little bit to some of the theory around racism as lived experience. And my thinking on this comes from Franz Fanon, who's one of the most famous and important theorists of racism um, from recent history. Franz Fanon was a Martinican a psychiatrist who lived and worked in Algeria during the Algerian struggle for independence against French colonialism. One of his most famous books is called Black Skin, White Masks, which he wrote in the early 1950s, and which, has, which continues to inform our thinking about race, particularly in situations of colonialism, and particularly as it affects uh, black people in various contexts. So Fanon's theorization of racism is based very much on his experience as a black person living under colonial rule. And it was Fanon who explained that in order to understand racism, we need to think about it as the lived experience of people who are um, interpolated by racism. Race, uh, Fanon is very focused on the particular experience of blackness. And he writes about how blackness is brought into being and given negative connotations. The first quote on the screen reads, for not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. Fanon explains that black people do not realize they are black, or rather that their blackness has a particular meaning. In other words, skin color only takes on importance in the context of racial domination, where the system is set up to privilege those with white skin and disadvantage people of color. Fanon says that his blackness doesn't mean anything outside of this negative relation of domination with the colonizer. So this was very clear in the colonial situation. Uh, so, for example, here in Australia, where white settlers consider themselves to be racially superior to Aboriginal people who were seen as less than human. The second quote reads, I discovered my own blackness, my ethnic characteristics, and I was battered down by tom-toms, cannibalism, intellectual deficiency, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships, and above all else, show good eaten. What Fanon is doing here is explaining that the colonial relationship means that black people start to internalize the negative attributes that are associated with their blackness by colonial rulers. The internalization of racism can often be seen at a very young age and seems to be reproduced in societies that have high levels of racial oppression and where the norm is generally considered to be white. So, for example, in societies like Australia, where there are very few black people in public life, very black people or racialized people in general, or uh, in positions of power, uh, so, for example, as leaders of industry, or particularly in the media, or, for example, if your school, your workplace, your neighborhood interactions, and so on, reinforce negative stereotypes associated with belonging to a racialized minority, it is highly likely that racialized people will start to internalize these feelings of inferiority, which can have damaging social and psychological implications. So for many people, thinking about representation is incredibly important. How to increase the numbers of uh, racialized people, for example, in the media, as teachers, both at school and at university, um, as representative of the society in general, because currently in Australia, the elites do not represent the ethnic diversity of the country uh, that I began by speaking about as being, uh, you know, Australia is a highly diverse country, but the leadership of the country does not actually reflect this. However, I would argue, or I would suggest, that representation is only one level at which to work, because of course, having more people of colour in the media does not solve systemic issues around, for example, over-incarceration, around um, migration and the treatment of asylum seekers, uh, and so on and so forth. So we need to think about all of these things as connected in various ways. Now, for Fanon, the outcome of racism is the invisibility of 
black people, which of course is paradoxical because on the one hand, a greater light is shone on people who are different and they are seen as other in society, but the result of this is an invisibilization of their concerns. And Fanon explains that this is intimately linked to the dehumanization of people of color in colonial situations or more broadly in systemically racist uh, states or, or, or societies. Racism is based on the idea that the racial other is less than human or even non-human. Because we do not see the racial other as somebody like ourselves, they easily become invisible to us. According to David Theo Goldberg, when people are made invisible, it is possible for harm against them to go unnoticed because their suffering is simply not seen. And this is what this picture here in the slide is about. You might be wondering why I have posted a picture of a beach. The story that this picture tells is of an event that happened in July 2008 in Rome in, in Italy. So in the background of the picture you see a group of people enjoying a day at the beach and in the foreground on the right you see a white object. That object is in fact a towel, a white towel, under which are the bodies of two little girls, Cristina and Violetta, who are two Roma girls. Now you have to understand that in Italy, Roma people from Eastern Europe are highly racialized, live in highly volatile and dangerous situations, are over-policed and often deported by force from the country and live in extreme poverty. Now these two little girls went into the water but they were unable to swim and they drowned. And their bodies were dragged up on the beach and they lay there under this towel for many, many hours while people went on swimming, sunbathing, enjoying lunch all around them. So the argument here is that they were literally made invisible and thus dehumanized. There's an example here uh, which also speaks to this problem. A recent study found that in from the United States found that white people assume that black people feel less pain and feel more empathy with a white person if seeing that person in pain. But black people too displayed less empathy towards other blacks according to the study. The study concluded that in general people feel more empathy towards those who are considered more privileged. In other words we have internalized the idea that more privileged people, whites in this instance, deserve our attention and concern. So if we connect this to the photograph here, I don't think we could imagine a situation in which two little white girls had drowned on a beach and had been left under a towel in the heat for hours and hours and hours. The so-called racial empathy gap between whites and blacks in the US is said to stem from the belief that all black people have the same experiences. This is a very common racial idea, you know, the idea that all X people are the same and feel the same. So in terms of pain, black people are believed to experience less pain because they have been through more hardships. One repercussion of this is that black people, it's a very practical repercussion, is that routinely black people in the US are given less pain medication than whites even when they are asking for it and even when they objectively need it. They're also given less anesthesia in situations of operations, for example. Philomena Essid's 1991 groundbreaking study of everyday racism in the Netherlands and the US helps us to understand what, it is, what is particular to the everydayness of racism. And in her research, she interviewed women of color about their experiences of everyday racism in both countries. Everyday racism are events which may appear banal and which may not even be recognized as racist by the individual to which they happen. They happen so often that they appear quote-unquote normal. Everyday racism often happens in routine situations, so for example while shopping, while driving, while at work, applying for a job, at school, and so on. In other words, it's not about being abused verbally or physically, although that also happens regularly. It's about something maybe more subtle. Philomena Essid explores how you can assess whether or not a situation is racist. Interestingly, she has to work through internalized feelings of racism that may make an individual deny that the situation that she has experienced is racist. In order to be able to assess whether or not a situation is racist, she explains that there's a need 
for general knowledge about racism. This must include historical information, so where does racism originate, as well as the realisation that racism changes continually and is different across times and contexts. In other words, people need a lot of information in order to assess a situation as being racist or not, and people become experts through dealing with racism. She proposes six steps towards assessing whether or not an event is racist. Firstly, she asks, is the situation acceptable or not? This may be difficult to judge, especially when racism is covert. So, for example, in a job interview situation, how can you tell if you didn't get the job because you are Muslim or maybe because you were just less qualified than the other candidates? She explains that we can assess this either by having access to information about all the candidates. This has, for example, been done by organisations at testing by sending in two identical CVs for a job application. One CV will have a white sounding name and one will have a foreign black Muslim name and or so on. A similar situation might be turning up for a job interview and being told that the position was already filled and if, if this happens on numerous occasions you might think that this is a situation of racism. However, if we don't have this information, we can also base our assessment on general knowledge. How often have you been rejected from a job in the past, for example? Have other people from your community had similar experiences? All of this counts towards assessing a situation as racist or not. According to ESSID, we need some objective criteria for judging the situation as acceptable or not. Secondly, acceptable excuses. Unacceptable behaviour may be excused with so-called acceptable reasons. So, for example, saying the position is already filled instead of you don't have the right look for the job, which might be more obviously racist. However, these so-called acceptable excuses have to be weighed against the individual's perception of the experience. So, did you feel that the excuse given was genuine when you were given the excuse? Thirdly, is it because I am black? Is it possible to eliminate all other possible reasons for not getting a job, for example, or being denied a seat or, or being adna denied admission to a nightclub? Does being black or Muslim or so on become the only possible reason for the discrimination? A student who experienced being asked to remove her hijab if she wanted to work as a shop assistant and who did not get the job when she refused can safely say she was the victim of racism because she was Muslim. In other words, there's, there's no other reason for her not getting the job in this instance. Fourthly, we need to ask, is this specific event excusable? Is it possible to find an objective reason for why the event is excusable? Essid remarks that sometimes other people of colour are blamed when an individual is discriminated against. So, for example, you might be told, it's nothing against you, but I've had bad experiences with, say, Aboriginals in the past. There is no way of knowing if this is really the case, because obviously you weren't there during that past experience. The specific event does not seem to be excusable, because the individual is being discriminated against on the basis of stereotypes about other people from the same background. In a Guardian article, the Aboriginal journalist Kelly Briggs told of a case of an Aboriginal student who was studying at a prestigious British university being questioned about her legitimacy to be there as it was assumed she was only there because she was Aboriginal so she got some kind of special favour rather than what was the case being a highly deserving very high quality student. Fifth question is the event socially significant? Even when someone acknowledges that an individual has experienced hurt, they may not acknowledge that the event was racist and part of a generalised trend. Racism is seen here as an isolated incident and excused on, the ba on this basis. Now this is extremely common and it's probably the, the most common reason given for racism. It was just an isolated event. We shouldn't tar everybody with the same brush. There is a reluctance to see racism as something that is socially significant, so as something affecting not only many racialized people, but society as a whole. Sixth point, evaluation. Knowledge about the specific event should be weighed up against our general knowledge. 
Do we know that these types of things happen to other people, for example? We might want to look at the unemployment rate among Aboriginal people as opposed to whites in Australia and assess that when an equally qualified Aboriginal person is passed over for a job, that this is very probably due to systemic racism. In other words, we can judge our experience of a particular situation in relation to the experiences of other people from uh, the same racialized group. Everyday racism happens to ordinary people in a variety of contexts every day. There's been a lot of attention paid over recent years to racism on public transport in Australia, leading, for example, to the hashtag I'll ride with you campaign and the Western Sydney University bystander anti-racism project. But the extent of everyday racism is brought home when it happens to a celebrity. Uh, one example from recent years was what happened to the Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates. To replay the incident briefly, Henry Gates is an extremely well-known professor of African-American studies from the prestigious Harvard University, was on the way back to his house in a taxi, um, and he arrived at his home, and as could happen to anybody, unfortunately, he couldn't find his keys. He was with his the driver of the taxi, who was somebody who he knew, and the two of them were trying to get into his house. It's at this point that a local police uh, officer observes the scene and decides to come and question Gates about what he was doing trying to enter his home. Gates obviously explains that this was his house and that he didn't have his keys and so on and so forth uh, and the officer not content with this response arrests Henry Louis Gates. Now obviously you know, this is somebody who has a very high, in addition to being a professor, he also has a series of television programs. He has a very high profile in the U.S. So obviously this is something that was played out on uh, on the media, uh, you know, many times after the actual event taking place. The obvious question that emerges here is that, you know, would a similar thing happen if Henry Gates had been white and not black? Would a middle-aged, middle-class white man have been questioned about his intent, you know, during a completely routine situation that could happen to every, anybody and everybody, losing your keys and trying to find another way into your home? So questions emerging from this could be, you know, for us to think about would be what levels of systemic racism based on preconceived ideas about racialized people have to be in existence for such a thing to happen. Could we imagine a situation uh, of the similar kind happening to somebody who was not racialized? Also, this is not an isolated incident. A short while after this happened to Henry Gates, the actor Forrest Whitaker was followed in a store by a security guard who thought that he was shoplifting. He didn't recognize Forrest Whitaker and assumed um, that he was up to no good in the shop, something that happens on an everyday routine basis to many racialized people in shopping situations. Shortly after that again, the television celebrity Oprah Winfrey, who was shopping while in Switzerland, was approached by the shop assistant and told that she couldn't afford the handbag that she was looking at and thinking of buying. So what I'd like you to think about during tutorials is how we can use Philomena Acid's uh, criteria for assessing situations as everyday racism or not to think about a variety of situations that may have happened to you or that may have happened um, to personalities in the media and so on. Now shifting in our last two slides to thinking about racism in popular culture and then briefly to racism in social media. One case that seems to emerge with rapid frequency in Australia is the emergence of incidents of what we can call blackface. Australia seems to have a recurring problem with blackface. Uh, one of the latest incidents being the Frankston Bombers iPod Shuffle themed costume party, which saw numerous players dress in blackface. So as you can see here in the picture, this is white people putting on the exaggerated features of black people and mocking black people by dressing in such a way. Blackface originates in the US and is exported all over the world. 
Blackface was donned by black and white minstrels, a form of popular entertainment in the day. This is why singer Harry Connick Jr. was so angry when he was invited to be a guest on the Hey Hey It Saturday show in 2009. This is a picture here from the show. Minstrelsy is about white people pretending to be exaggerated versions of black people who are often characterized in the shows as childlike, lovable simpletons. Minstrelsy began during the era of slavery, so obviously cannot be divorced from black domination in the U.S. According to the American historian David Rodiger, American blackface helped to define what whiteness was in the United States, writing that blackface usually involved a conscious declaration of whiteness and white supremacy. Does blackface have the same meaning in Australia? According to John Stratton, we can begin to understand blackface in Australia in terms of the establishment of whiteness against an excluded other, an absent other who has been excluded from Australia as well as from Australian society. When Aboriginal rapper Adam Briggs pointed out that another incident of blackface in February 2016 was racist, he was lambasted on social media, called names including petrol sniffer and filthy half-breed and even told to kill himself. Blackface was understood by the white commenters online as only a joke. However, in response, Briggs commented, and I quote, People look at me like it's my problem, like pointing, pointing out racism in wor is worse than the act itself. Saying that's racist creates more drama than the actual blackface situation. In other words, when racism is pointed out, the reaction is usually one of denial, and the effort is made to see those who point out racism as the problem rather than making racism itself the problem. And these are situations that play out again and again and again in popular culture um, every, you know, every so often. Again, uh, you know, raising the issue of whether or not racism is something that can be unlearned or whether there are more systemic approaches to tackling racism that we need to think about. Social media and the internet are obviously rife with racism and many people who work on social media and the impact of digital technology on society will now say that we really shouldn't think of the offline and the online worlds as separate. We need to think about how these two are basically mirrors of each other and how we live so much of our lives online these days that there's no way of separating the offline and the offline. According to the British sociologist Sanjay Sharma, modalities of race wildly proliferate in social media sites such as Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Casual racial banter, race hate comments, so-called griefing, images, videos and anti-racist sentiment bewilderingly intermingle, mash up and virally circulate. And he says researchers struggle to comprehend the meanings and affects of what he calls a racialized info overload. There is so much racism online. Many researchers are concerned with racist extremism and hate speech online. In Australia, for example, there is the Online Hate Prevention Institute, which tries to prevent hate speech online. Uh, and for example, if we look back to the um, 2010 murders in Oslo uh, by the right-wing extremist extremist Anders Bering Breivik, he compiled a compendium that explained his anti-Muslim stance which led him to uh, this murderous spree. And most of the articles, blogs, websites and so on that he relied on to build up this compendium or manifesto, he took from mainstream news sources and websites that were easy to find online. In other words, it's not just right-wing extremist hate speech, but also the racism that's reproduced in a banal sense, either through the popular culture, as we saw before in relation to, to blackface, or uh, just through mainstream uh, commentary, uh, which is, you know, questioning the rights of asylum seekers or questioning the legitimacy of Aboriginal people, linking them to criminality and recommending their incarceration and so on. The anonymity of the web and social media also exacerbates racism. People may be much more ready to be openly racist online than they would in public. And the examples that I've collected here are just a few of the types of racism that we see frequently online. One of the people in Australia who's received the most 
racist you know, hate commentary is the Muslim activist Mariam Vesadeh. Uh, there are even attacks against me posted by the right-wing um, movement Stormfront Down Under. Uh, there's the Aboriginal Memes Facebook group, which reproduces appalling racist, racism against Aboriginal people, but which Facebook refused to take down um, despite numerous protests from numerous people across Australia. Another incident over recent years was the Twitter furor against Miss USA being named an Indian American uh, woman. There were similar um, outpourings of rage when uh, an Afro-Japanese woman was named Miss Japan uh, a few years ago. So while the first example is one of an extreme right-wing organization, the others are everyday people with no necessary affiliation to extremist groups. So we should ask, how can we understand everyday racism in the era of social media? Is social media merely a representation of real life? Or are there other dynamics at play? Is racism in social media another example of something like cyberbullying? It seems that despite the fact that many advances have been made on combating racism, that it is still rife and being exacerbated by the possibilities afforded by social media platforms and digital technology. Clearly there is much research left to be done. I encourage anybody who's interested to participate in the racial state, that second year unit, uh, where much more in-depth work will be done on all of these various aspects. Thank you.